The Rock disputes a report about an XFL rights deal to Pro Football Newsroom's James Larson. I'm talking to James about that, plus a look ahead to the USFL playoffs. Here with James Larson from Pro Football Newsroom. You can follow him at James Larson PFN. He gets a reply from The Rock on Twitter and is still humble enough to join me here on John Lewis Sports on YouTube. But James, really appreciate it, man. You're you're big time. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, yeah, it's been fun. How you doing, John? Uh, I'm doing good. I also got to say this, and this is not an ad. Um, I, I got to thank uh, the USFL Newsroom also who you work for, Pro Football Newsroom, which is also XFL Newsroom and USFL Newsroom. I got 10% off on an Orlando Raid shirt, so I was uh, pretty happy oh, right about on. that, using that that code. So visit the site, and you can see what I'm talking about. Let's talk about the new XFL here. Uh, the headline, James, was that this past week, the XFL had lost $60 million in its first year. And also, Andrew Marshan of the New York Post reported that there was no $20 million deal with Disney – um, you tweeted what Andrew Marshawn said. The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, responded to your tweet, and here's what he said. He said, not true. ESPN is a stakeholder in XFL, long-term partners, big plans for the 2024 season, back to work. James, now what did you make of all that? Well, I thought his response was quite intriguing, just simply because of the wording that he used. Uh, it was very vague. And to the extent of he didn't really actually address Andrew's statement. He didn't talk about a rights deal or a rights fee. All he said was that ESPN was a stakeholder in the XFL, which is something that we've already known. I mean, obviously, they're a stakeholder in the XFL. So I think, um, you know, it's it's the way PR works. He, the, he obviously, you know, there's things going on behind the scenes. And we don't know all the details. Of course, there, there could be some NDAs in place. So I, I completely understand from his perspective that there's things that he can and cannot say. But I did think it was just interesting that he didn't actually address what Marchan actually said in his report. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's some semantics probably at play here. You know, they could say, oh, well, we have a deal with Disney, but it could be a deal like kind of like the Alliance of American Football, which we'll talk about the finances of that. You brought up, you have a really wide ranging article about all this that was really good on XFL Newsroom. Is that, you know, they could be just providing the production, but not necessarily paying the XFL in addition, a $20 million rights fee to me would be a whole lot for a, um, for an upcoming spring football league to straight out pay $20 million to the XFL. I mean, my speculation was that could be the value of what they are providing. Does that make some kind of financial sense there? Absolutely. That You know, that's the point I was actually going to make is I think yeah. I think you're on the right track. I really feel like that's probably where the situation probably lies. And I, I think if you look at it, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he mentioned that, you know, every time there's a rights deal in place or something like this happens, there's always a number associated with it, right? But when ESPN struck this deal, or when Disney, should I say, struck this deal with the XFL, there was no number released. So again, there could be some NDA in play uh, somewhere in the background. But, you know, we always know this information. Typically, when it comes to these leagues, whether, whether the MLS, for example, we know about their deals with Fox and with Apple and this and that. So I think that's a bit of a telltale sign that there's something else going on behind the scenes here. Yeah, I think you think there's something to that. Um, and this is a thing that's going to get worked out. Uh, this was a first year. Granted, this is the third iteration of the XFL. But, you know, as you know, and as you have written about, um, they I don't think that anyone thought they were going to be profitable after the first year. The headline, again, was the XFL lost $60 million. OK, in the first year, as you point out in your article, the Alliance of American Football, which I don't want to I don't want to even compare the two because the Alliance of American Football was so poorly run and felt like a shell game. But you you brought it up. They needed a quarter of a million dollars or something like that just after week one. A loss of 60 million dollars compared to that over a, the course of the season is not bad. No, not at all. And <laughs> I guess here's the thing is the 60 million dollar figure does seem a bit fishy. And by that, I mean, you know, the XFL didn't come out and say 60 million. It was Forbes reporting from their industry right. sources. And since then, the XFL has kind of stood by Forbes report, especially since Andrew Marchand released whatever he said. Uh, but I think, you know, based on certain things that I've heard, and this was long before that Forbes report came out, 60 million is definitely a conservative number. If it's 60 million, yeah. they're in good shape. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so everyone who's uh, pouncing on, uh, oh, look, they lost sixty million dollars. That that might be more of a positive uh, than a negative. <laughs> Good, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at how much they would have to spend in season one, mm-hmm. especially because I know that they have the hub model, which helps save on some costs. But they're still traveling to all these cities. They're still playing in all these markets. They're paying for stadiums like Lumen Field in Seattle, the Dome in St. Louis, which we know is an expensive venue to use. I I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but I remember some of that information from 2020 was was released, and it was like they were spending a lot of money to use those facilities. So, yeah, it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Let's talk about the, you know, there was some restructuring in the offseason. That's going to happen with any league. Um, that makes it to a second season. You you learn from your mistakes. You learn what worked. You learn what didn't work. There was some restructuring com- coming out um, out of 2023. I think the outlook for 2024. I mean, I think there will be an XFL, but I think they the financials. Um, I know there was there's been some reporting that they plan to have a revenue of 100 million dollars. That's revenue, not necessarily a profit, but at least 100 million dollars in revenue. But I feel like if the financials are the same next year as they were this year, the outlook for 2025 might be a little shaky. What do you think? You know, I think that's what it's going to come down to is season two is going to, is going to be so pivotal and also what happens after season two, because when you compare the the landscape of what the XFL has compared to the USFL, for example, the XFL is banking a bit more on for one Redbird capital. And then secondly, you know, hoping that some outside investors will eventually come in and buy these teams and, I think the game plan would be to get through season two, maybe look at season three, and then eventually, you know, get the teams appraised and then hope that they can find buyers who who would want to really invest in these teams and grow, continuing to, to grow them in those markets. So, yeah, it, it's tough to say exactly how things are going to look. I'd say if they have another season like season one, it's not going to be super pretty. But uh, the the what am I trying to say? The excitement is there. The hype is there. The product is great. So if they can just get some outside investors, I think I think they'll be in good shape. Yep, I, I agree. I, I'm I'm trying to stay cautiously optimistic because, as we've talked about before, I'm just a little bit older than you are. So I remember the original XFL. I remember the original USFL. And you know, you you try to be cautiously optimistic uh, as these things move along. Well, the XFL going into season two, USFL wrapping up season two, um, playoff set now. It's going to be. New Orleans and Birmingham playing for the South Division title, uh, Pittsburgh and Michigan in the North, Michigan with absolute, especially when EJ Perry <laughs> comes in off the street and leads Michigan to a win. And he looked lost the first half, but looked like a different quarterback that second half. You know, it was one of those things. It just, it really just fits what the USFL has been all <laughs> season long, right? I mean, this is spring football. Anything can happen. I really love the move by Mike Nolan because this is something I've been pushing for for so long was, Give someone else a shot. You know, nothing, no disrespect to Josh Love, but he's just clearly not the guy, at least in that offense. Um, especially last week, those four interceptions against Pittsburgh just absolutely killed him. So to see EJ Perry come in off the street and do what he did was really impressive. And as you mentioned, you know, it, it takes time to, when you're playing at the professional level, like that first half wasn't perfect, but he didn't turn the ball over. He didn't make too many major mistakes. And then that second half, he came around and. You no, know, you, you've been to all the games there at Ford Field. Um, and you've been kind of following Michigan Panthers. Uh, it still feels to me, though, like we're going to see the USFL championship this weekend between New Orleans and Birmingham because it just feels like I don't know either of those teams with Michigan and Pittsburgh can really match up that well against the winner of the South. What are your thoughts? I think the biggest difference between these two divisions is comes down to the offenses because – Pittsburgh and Michigan both boast some really solid defenses. I'd, I'd argue that the Maulers have the best defense in the league. Uh, so I think that that just gives them a little bit of a, an advantage in the North. But the South, I mean, as you mentioned, they've just been so strong this whole season. Birmingham's had an excellent year. They were one, they've won five straight. Alex Magoo is definitely the MVP. I mean, they're riding Magoo magic hot right now. <laughs> and I'm excited to see this, this rematch because now you've got McLeod Bethel Thompson in there, who he's had some ups and downs this season. But he's really coming to his own, and John D. Filippo and, and Bethel Thompson, they just have such great veteran chemistry. These are two guys, they've been in these situations before. They've always found a way to get the job done. You know, you've got the the championship experience of both those guys, D. Filippo yeah. in the NFL and McLeod Bethel Thompson in the CFL. So we'll see what happens. I'm expecting a great crowd in Birmingham. Should be a fun outing. 
Yeah, I, I think it's going to be good. I think, you know, New Orleans is, uh, if you follow spring football uh, from week one, that has been uh, absolutely one of the best stories, uh, I think, in spring football with John D. Filippo, um, you know, running out on that field and being emotional uh, in week one be, he, because he's just – he's been, had some health problems that would, has uh, affected his mobility there or he did, you know, leading into the opening week. And he was just – he said, I was going to run onto that field as, as a head coach for the first time, and he did. And he's had one of the absolute best teams uh, in the USFL. And you're right, Alex Magoo, I mean – Listen, I, I thought the season was over when Jamar Smith was hurt week one. That's it. Birmingham's not going to repeat. Now I think that uh, it, I think they're going to repeat. I, I, I don't know. It's going to be a fun weekend. Um, tell me again, you know, we talked about there that you'd meant all the uh, – what was it like there? Again, it's hard to kind of get a feel just watching the game. Right. So Ford Field for the Michigan games, they had some really good crowds. I think the, the biggest factor taken into consideration is how big Ford Field is, yeah. especially that lower bowl. So while it does look sparse at times on TV, I mean, you'd have to have like probably 30,000 people in there to really fill that lower bowl and make it look good. So they have filled in both sides pretty solidly. Last night looked really good. Uh, I'd say at least 10,000 in attendance. And it sounds very loud. Being inside, you know, having the dome certainly helps. So last night, you know, a couple of those crowd breaks, I was having to be like, oh, man, my ears might have a little bit of damage. It was loud. Uh <clears throat> You know, it's also like a very stark contrast because I've been to all the Stars games as well. And that one, you can hear a pin drop from sure. across the, you, you know, I'm on one sideline and I can hear the coaches on the other sideline talking and you can hear everything they're saying. So, uh, you know, it's an interesting feel. And again, the hub model is something that they've done because it's, it's how they operate based on costs and saving right. money. So it makes sense. Uh, Ken, I actually, I went to Ken in week eight, uh, which yeah. was fun. I got to watch uh, when they when they faced off against Houston and Memphis, uh, New Jersey and Pittsburgh. And, you know, for for all intents and purposes, considering neither team is a Canton team, they had decent crowds, you know, yeah. a couple thousand people there. It's a smaller, more intimate setting, but it's not it's not by any means bad. It's just unique and different. Yep. It's uh, it, it's been fun. I, I like the four hub system. I'd love to see the USFL uh, pull the trigger and put a home team in Canton. So we'll see if that that might happen. Uh you know, let's let's get let's get through the season. And let's get to a season three before that happens. James Larson works for Pro Football uh, Newsroom. You can follow him at James Larson PFN XFL Newsroom USFL Newsroom. Uh, you write for them all, and uh, he got a response from The Rock on Twitter, and still joined me here. I mean, this is he, you're a rising star, son. The Rock, who? I mean, I'm with John Lewis <laughs> right now, man. That's right. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep that one. I'm keeping that clip. James, appreciate you joining me. Thank you. Of course, anytime.